All right, let's go ahead and take a look at module 11, hacking web servers. Uh, this will be an extension of what we started with hacking web applications from our previous module, session hijacking. So really we have about four modules that deal with you know, web applications and, and hacking web servers. So um, we're going to be taking a look at, uh, in this module, uh, taking a look at some web server concepts, understanding web server attacks, web server attack methodology, web server attack tools, countermeasures against web server attacks, an overview of patch management, web server security tools, and then an overview of web server penetration testing. All right, so um, what is the primary issue with web servers? Well, they're highly available. We want people to connect to our website. We want to have visitors to our website. It's accessible from the outside world. And quite often, it is inadequately protected. So when you think about it, you've got a host that is connected. You can reach it from anywhere on the planet. You've got the operating system, you've got the web application, you have the web server platform, and then you've got some uh, database interaction that are all potential attack points. So this whole realm, this whole web application hacking is monstrous. Uh, there's going to be a few different categories that we're going to be taking a look at over the next couple modules, uh, some different types of, of categorical attacks, but the possibilities are, are almost limitless on web applications. So uh, the slide is depicting uh, the, the vulnerability um, uh, profiler stack here, uh, custom web applications, third-party components, the database, the web server itself. In this case, we'll be looking at Apache and Microsoft's IIS. You have the underlying operating system. So you've got the whole OS code base that's potentially uh, vulnerable as well. And then our, our network and security as well. So we'll be focusing in on the server itself and identifying some potential issues that may come into play for uh, to um, uh, that may come into play to make a web server vulnerable. So there's a lot of laundry lists in these uh, these next couple modules. So we'll be hitting on a, a few of the highlights. I'm going to let you sort of read through some of the, the the details on these slides rather than just read everything off to you. But um, one issue that we're going to be taking a look at pretty uh, pretty soon here in the next few slides is going to be like directory traversal. So improper file and directory permissions. If I'm gaining access to the web server using a certain security context, does that context have access to local file and folder structure? And what happens if I escape the constraints of that web root directory? So uh, directory traversal attacks are specifically getting out of that constrained root directory and exploring other areas of the file system. So we'll talk about some, uh, some potential uh, issues with that. Default settings. Uh, default settings quite often are geared towards functionality which we've talked about time and again, functionality is directly you know, disproportionate or inverse to security. Um, unnecessary services enabled, also potentially indicating a default configuration. So as the years have gone by, we've seen a lot more you know, locked down initial installs, but you know, back in the days of 2000, you install 2000 server, IS5 was installed, everything was turned on, I mean, you know, monstrous attack surface. So as the years have gone on, we've seen you know, the, the requirement to actually start the application server, enable specific services. But unnecessary services give us a larger attack front, a uh, larger attack uh, uh, surface. So we've talked about that a bit as well. Uh, security conflicts with business ease of use. So we need to make something work. And in order to do that, maybe we have to relax permissions, uh, enable functionalities that may be insecure, but it's all for the purpose of getting the business function done. So security conflicts with business ease of use case. Lack of proper policy, procedures, and maintenance. We, we, we established earlier on that policy is the underlying, underlying foundation of everything we do security-wise. So without a proper policy, we don't have you know, this uh, whole determination of what we need to do to harden the server. We have that lack of standardization. We also have that lack of uniformity. If that policy has been written and it says specifically, here's what we're going to do to lock this thing down, then you've got a you know, machine-specific policy that relates to all the types of servers that that policy deals with. So then again, you get your consistency. So lack of proper security policy means chaotic security configuration. Improper authentication with external systems. So if you are authenticating with other boxes, you're accessing like virtual directories across the network, interacting with other web application components, that authentication can potentially be leveraged to give you excessive privileges. So when we start talking about things like SQL injection, quite often the application will connect under DBO or the SQL admin account that has a system security context in the Microsoft environment. And just to make it work, we don't necessarily need that level of access 
that's excessive and we may be able to potentially leverage that to execute system level or, or level commands. Default accounts with default or no passwords. Well, we talked about default password sites and a lot of those sites deal with appliances. So you've got you know, different particular you know, routers, switches and so forth, the default passwords. But you may set up default accounts also uh, on your web application, uh, default or even worse, no passwords. Uh, unnecessary default backup or sample files. Misconfigurations in the operating system and networks, that's pretty, you know, it's a pretty general, uh, general statement. Bugs, absolutely. We're going to be taking a look at the exploitation of several bugs in web server implementations in this module and in the next two modules. Misconfigured SSL certificates and encryption settings. So we talked about self-signed certificates. We looked at that in the previous module. Uh, we talked about SSL certificates that are self-signed sort of condition us to accept certificates and certificate errors, more likely to uh, be duped by a you know, falsified or forged certificate. Uh, administrative or debugging functions enabled and accessible on web servers. Default admin pages, if those are accessible, there's going to give you remote administrative access to the server. Use of self-signed certificates and default certificates, we've, uh, we've talked about that. All right, so the impact of web server attacks. Once I've gained access to the web server, I may compromise user accounts. And we're, we're going to see some examples of escalating privileges. We've already seen some of that in previous modules as well. Website defacement. So website defacement is going to happen in a couple different flavors. Number one, you deface the website directly by accessing the web server, making content changes to the website itself, or potentially standing up a copy, a defaced copy of the website, and then using DNS poisoning techniques to, uh, to poison visitors away to that defaced copy of the page. Secondary attacks from the website, we're going to see some examples like cross-site scripting, where we're using attacks, file system includes, or uh, local file, remote file includes, things like that. Um, we're going to see you know, a couple more examples of cross-site scripting, stealing session cookies, root access to other applications or servers, leveraging the web server's security context with whatever application it's running, and also potentially maybe in database backends. Uh, data tampering and data theft, which we'll see a little bit more of that uh, specifically when we get into our SQL injection module. All right, so open source web server architecture. We're going to sort of differentiate a little bit between the Linux environment and the IIS or Microsoft environment. So just a quick sort of structural anatomy breakdown here. Uh, when you're talking about open source, you're probably talking about an Apache server, probably talking about PHP for the application uh, code itself, Linux underlying file system, uh, and then potentially some email functionality. And then generally you will have sort of data, some sort of database interoperability. So uh, MySQL, typically what we think of uh, when we're in the open source or the Linux environments. All right, IIS, a little bit different here. Uh, client connects through the stack to the service host that actually hosts the Windows processes and Windows services, uh, the core itself. And there's also potentially native modules that may have weaknesses as well that could potentially be exploited. All right, so DOS and DDoS attacks. We did a pretty good summarization of DOS and DDoS attacks in our denial service module. So we know that the possibilities are you know, bandwidth depletion, sending malformed packets, overloading the server's ability to respond. And we covered the, um, a few flavors of DOS and DDoS attacks in our denial service module. DNS server hijacking. All right, so in, this, in the malware, th or the sniffers module, we talked about some of the DNS poisoning techniques. Now, if I'm DNS server hijacking, I could actually be, well, it could happen a couple ways. You could, you know, take over a legitimate DNS server, modify, you know, cache entries and things like that, uh, or changing uh, the DNS settings on the victim to target uh, the specific server that hosts the, the poison record. So we talked about how DNS poisoning works in our snippers module, and we talked about a couple ways to, to make that happen. So we could use a, like, uh, even like a NetSH command, NetSH script, to change the DNS settings to point to the attacker server. We also have potentially direct DNS server compromise. All right, amplification attack. Now again, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in the, in the last couple slides, we took a look at in our denial service module. So we talked a bit about the DNS amplification attacks. Remember the amplification attacks in general are gonna be a situation where we send a request of a certain size, and will get a much larger response back. So this goes back to, and we talked a little bit about this in, in denial service, the recursion method, 
to perform a DNS amplification attack by like requesting zone file information from DNS servers, spoofing the source address, and then you get like a zone file um, uh, or cache uh, file back to the clients. So we talked about that, uh, how that works in our denial service module.